Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Applying a Climate Framework to Capital Markets session. We are very glad to have you here with us today. If I could have the next slide, please. We would like to start by thanking our sponsors, JP Morgan, Credit Suisse, Ping N, Moody's ESG Solutions, Luxembourg Green Exchange, City, Refinitiv, BNP Paribas, IHS Market, Allianz Bernstein, FSD Africa, Inter-American Development Bank, ICMA, Mizuhu, IFC, and Ashurst. Could I have the next slide, please? Before we start, I would um, just like to give you um, a few important reminders. To the audience, please use the Q&A box to ask, to ask your questions. Thoughts, comments, and any other queries about the conference can be addressed via the chat box where we have our team ready to assist you. Live interpretation is available in Portuguese, Spanish, Mandarin, and French. The headphone icon on your screen will lead you to the options. All sessions are being recorded and will be available to you on this app until November. Make use of the very exciting tools that SwapCard offers, network with thousands of attendees, and visit our virtual booths where you will find information about our latest reports and learn more about our incredible sponsors. Members of the media, for any interviews requests, please visit the Climate Bonds virtual booth. Our comms team is ready to assist you. Um, and now Calvin, our host today, will present you our amazing speakers. Over to you, Calvin. Thank you very much, Luisa. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everybody who's taking part in this event. My name is Calvin Quek, and I'm an environmental specialist at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and I'll be hosting this workshop. First off, if I may, on behalf of AIB and their program partners at Moody, Fitch, and Carbon Trust, we are delighted and honored to present the opening workshop at CBI's annual conference this year. Ladies and gentlemen, the recent interplanetary uh, panel on climate change report starkly outlines the challenges we face regarding the physical effects of climate change. The earth has risen in, in temperature of about one degree since the late 1800s. With surface temperatures rising faster than any 50 year period over the past 2000 years since 1970. Now, even under a low emission scenario, temperatures are expected to rise by 1.5 degrees by 2040 and sea levels will rise by 0 0.35 meters by 2050. And there are many ways one can internalize all of these statistics, but what appears to be a constant cascade of extreme weather events over the past several months is probably going to become the norm. Under present one degree warming levels, the frequency of a 10 year extreme temperature event is now 2.8 times likely to occur compared with a climate without human influence. And for a 50 year event, the likelihood is 4.8 times. Thus, ladies and gentlemen, what once appeared to be freak occurrences of weather events is now increasingly the norm. Tail end events are no longer going to be tail end events. Thus, it is the urgency to address climate change has never been higher. It is, it is with this sense of urgency that AIB and Amundi have developed a toolkit for investors to apply a climate framework to capital markets that is aligned with the recommendations of the Paris Agreement. In this presentation, we, AIB, Amundi, along with our program partners, will present to you a recap of the AIB Amundi framework, which was launched last year, how this framework is applied to a basket of securities, and more importantly, and this is the main focus of today's presentation, how the framework that we developed held up under the scrutiny and testing of our program partners. Today with me on this panel is Jingyi Tang, investment, offer, investment officer at Asia Investment Investment Bank, Tobias Heisenberger from Mundi, Xing Yi Lao from the Carbon Trust, Krista Tukianen from the Climate Bonds Initiative, and Michelle Carvias. 
as I've outlined previously, this will be the order of our presentation today. And we'll start first with a very high level overview again of the AIB Amundi Climate Investment Framework, which we launched last year, incidentally, at the CBI conference. With this, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Jing Yi, who will walk us through the first section of today's presentation. Hi, Kevin. Many thanks for your introduction. Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to everyone dialing in and from the world. I'm very excited to introduce you the AIID Amundi Climate Change Investment Framework. We would like to thank CBI for not only endorsing this framework, but also allowing us to have this framework presented within CBI's annual meeting with our market development partners, Fitch, Carbon Trust, and CBI. Uh, Calvin, can you help turn to the next slide? So our framework, thank you, is defining a holistic climate investing approach based on the three main objectives of Paris Agreement, which are climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, and financial flow alignment. I will dive into the next slide uh, about this Paris Agreement objectives. AIID as the MDB, we are very aware of the risks and opportunities presented by climate change, and we want to convince other like-minded investors to do the same by three distinct actions as shown in this slide. First one, we created a an investment framework for investors to have a methodology or handbook for investment decisions. Second, we provide investors with a live case study on the application of this framework. This refers to the AIIB's Asia Climate Bond portfolio. This idea came when AIB team met with the world's largest institutional investors. And in the in 2019, right before the COVID hit us, when we shared our idea of providing the framework, they told us uh, the framework is great, but having a case study is even better. And they added, so can AIB go first in investing using this framework? So that's exactly what we did. We has committed US dollar 500 million into a portfolio that will purchase emerging market Asia, um, Asia bonds. And we plan to share the results with interested institutional investors to help them get going. Last but not least, we have also designed a market education program with our partners to mobilize investors under this framework to train and educate issuers and to engage data providers and policy maker, makers in order to build a better ecosystem. Uh, next slide. Hi, Kevin, can you turn to the next slide? So um, what do we mean by the holistic integration of climate change? Uh, thank you. Um, holistic integration of climate risk and opportunities into investment considerations. So the Paris Agreement is the go-to reference point for global actions on tackling climate change. It has three recommendations as shown in this, um, in this slide. The first recommendation addresses a climate change mitigation. It seeks to minimize the transition risk by limiting the global temperature increase to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The second recommendation addresses the climate change adaptation and it seeks to mitigate the physical risk by increasing resilience to the adverse impact of climate change. The third objective addresses the transition effort made by all of us, which should support financial flows towards low greenhouse gas and climate resilient activities. One example would be for a company to have more green business every year as part of their overall revenue. So what's interesting is that for every risk, there also exist opportunities. The opportunities is that if a company was to follow the Paris Agreement recommendation, they would not only survive, but also thrive in a climate changed world. So our analysis actually defines three types of issues. The first type in the red box 
are issues that perform poorly on these variables. So these issues are excluded from our free work and from our investment. The second type, we call them delist issues. They are moving in the right direction, but not there yet. So they are eligible and targeted for further engagement. And the last type, we call them A-list issues. They are outperforming for all variables. So for this investment strategy targeting these issues, we, it is more resilient to climate change risk, and it is more exposed to opportunities not priced in by the market uh, currently. So now, now let me pass the time over to uh, my colleague from Amundi Tobias to talk about the framework and our portfolio in more details. Thank you. Thanks, Jingyi, and hi, everyone. So just for, for a quick introduction, so my name is Tobias Tessenberger. I work at Amundi. Um, we're essentially a team of uh, helping clients like AIB and other uh, development finance institutions set up uh, some sustainable finance initiatives. Um, so what I'm going to run through now in the next few slides will be um, specific steps that we've taken after, after developing the framework with AIB. So they were alluded to in Jenny's speech, one of them being actually applying the framework to a concrete investment portfolio. And I'll delve into a few challenges and, and outcomes that are worth sharing with you all today. Um, and then I'll briefly go into also the next step that we're working on currently, which is, that, which is actually enacting the framework uh, in relation to that portfolio. So everything around building an effective engagement program, uh, focusing on those B-list issues that, that Jenny uh, highlighted nicely for us. So as, uh, as Jenny explained, uh, what we set out to do after having designed the framework was actually apply it to a concrete portfolio. And in doing so, along with the aim of building a portfolio with the common financial characteristics of emerging market debt, there were a couple of key objectives that we wanted to also uphold. So I think here we can we can jump to the next slide, Calvin, if it's possible. Thanks. Um, so these objectives that I mentioned relate to applying the framework successfully uh, to ensure an appropriately high quality ESG profile of the companies in the portfolio. And these objectives are specific, specifically split, sorry, uh, between two objectives. On the one hand, this relates to, first of all, selecting the ESG data uh, the ESG data providers under each fair, uh, variable of the framework, whose methodologies we want to be as close to the framework as, as possible. So on physical risk, transition risk, and green revenue. And thereafter, the second objective uh, related to actually using these data sets appropriately um, and having a specific process to use the data and select eligible companies where we really um, wanted to essentially be able to target companies that really were in line with our idea of what a B-list company is. Um, so in regards to the first objective, uh, what we did is we ran a global request for proposal of all ESG data providers um, to select one ESG data set per variable underneath the framework. Um, what we found was that it wasn't a question of whether these data sets were available or not in relation to these topics. Um, however, there was quite a difference uh, in a spectrum of methodologies that we had available to us and actually the coverage of these ESG the uh, data sets differed quite a lot to our actual investment universe we were interested in. So emerging market debt with, a, with quite a bit of focus on Asia. Um, and quite quickly, those two aspects of you know, methodo methodological appropriateness and coverage became our two defining variables to select the ESG data sets for, for, this, for, for this portfolio. And if I could just focus on those two variables to provide you with some insights, what we learned was that the methodologies that related to transition risk or green revenue um, seemed to be the most mature. When we got into the topics of physical risk, um, there were some things that you, you know, we felt should be included in these data sets going forward, hopefully. So just to give you one example, when it came to phys physical risk methodologies, um, they didn't include remediation strategies of companies who are exposed to physical risk of, of climate change, such as corporate supply chain and disaster management, for example. Um, and when you're doing emerging markets investing, that can become quite a, a headache, if you will, since we know emerging markets are the most exposed and thus you, you run the danger of essentially punishing companies for the exposure rather than rewarding their activities to dealing with their exposure. So at the same time, if we focus on the coverage variable, uh, the data sets varied a lot as well. Uh, we actually found that you know, the most constraining variable of the framework and application was, was green revenue and the overall data sets for all of them 
emerging markets weren't as well covered, especially related to debt issues as well, compared to uh, you know, the usual large public companies in, in developed markets. So we found that debt issuers and, and, uh, and emerging markets seem to fall through the cracks a bit. And so we had to actually, in some cases, combine some data sets to, to have the information available, to be able to verify data points and have the coverage that we wanted to build a, a diversified portfolio. Um, so that was, you know, that was the process of actually selecting the ESG data providers. We got to the end of that and we have one ESG data provider per variable now. Um, finally, in terms of actually selecting the issuers for the portfolio, so the second objective that I alluded to, um, we, as we said, we wanted to populate this portfolio with as many B-list issuers as possible, partly because A-list issuers perhaps don't exist today, but also, you know, if you want to build a portfolio for engagement purposes, you don't want to be focusing on the A-list, you want to be in the B-list, you want to have those unique uh, engagement opportunities where you could potentially drive change in these corporates. Um, so this was our second objective, and we wanted to implement a clear and clean issuer selection approach to apply the framework. Uh, again, we wanted, to, we wanted to focus on being inclusive of the laggards rather than punishing them for low score, scores. And what this basically fundamentally meant was balancing certain eligibility thresholds under each variable um, to, to, of course, according to the ESG data provided a specific scale that we had and selecting and setting the thresholds at a specific place where we would, first of all, let's say exclude companies with ESG controversies who are not taking climate change seriously. So the first red box that Jimmy had in her, on her slide, while also including those companies that may not have the best scores, but do show promising signs of them starting to take climate change seriously, but are faced with complex challenges in their transition today. And overall, again, we aim to populate the portfolio with as many of these types of companies as possible. And uh, all in all, if we could just jump to the next slide here as well. Thanks. All in all, we, you know, we, we actually managed to do this. This allowed us to build a portfolio with conventional emerging market debt characteristics, focused on AIB's regional member countries predominantly, uh, corporates, financial institutions, and trying to make this portfolio as infrastructure oriented as, per, as possible. So I hope the key message here is that this, this can be done in practice. Um, for all investors, there will be little hiccups and challenges along the way, but these can be overcome. And it, it is possible to, on one hand, build a portfolio with high quality ESG profile in line with the framework's objectives and applying it to quite a challenging um, asset class, such as emerging market debt, because um, it might be more, let's say, easier geographies uh, to apply to, such as developed markets. Um, so finally, once we had built the portfolio and had it invested, the first challenge we could say was, was passed. Uh, the next challenge, uh, what I would like to talk about is actually enacting the framework. Um, so here, if we could just jump to the next slide, please. Great, thanks. Um, so this is all about enacting the framework's purpose to mobilize B-list issuers into the A-list. Quite simply, this is done through engagement with the issuers in our portfolio. Um, so what that meant was building a tailored engagement plan based on the framework, uh, which followed a few steps, and I'll just run, run through them to give you a good idea of what we did. Um, so first of all, we had to go through the portfolio and identify the B-list companies and the individual corresponding reasons per company why they were in the B-list. This essentially highlighted to us the main challenges companies were facing when it came to the climate change strategy and transition. This could either be the challenges related to transition risk, to physical risk, to green revenue, and of course, a multitude of the two or three. These were not seen as, you know, as being in silos, let's say. Um, so with that in mind, what we were basically, what we basically came up with were buckets of companies that were not in the A-list because of certain commonalities actually in their scoring. So either that being uh, their transition risk was below the threshold and so on and so forth. Then of course, we obviously can't stay at the level of just the score. So we dug a little deeper into the company's score and the reasons behind them being in the B-list and having a score, let's say below the threshold of, the, of, the, of an A-list issuer. And we started to find uh, some, some co reoccurring commonalities across companies again. For example, on transition risks, you can imagine that we noticed an absence of an emissions reduction target, which relates to whether a company measures its carbon footprint and whether they have an emissions reductions or climate change strategy in place. Other transition risk considerations are around whether there's a clear governance structure in place to ensure these commitments of the company will be implemented and achieved. Findings on green revenue very much focused on product development plans and the capital expenditure plans of the companies to green their assets, for example. And of course, there's always the question around appropriate disclosure uh, of these activities. 
relating to TCFD and how the information should be structured to then be picked up by the ESG data providers for us to be able to see. And so when what we basically had was this you know, bucket of different commonalities that we saw in the issuers and what these essentially became were our specific criteria or, or indicators that were integrated into our engagement strategy or, or leading it. Uh, and in the end, we identified what was providing the company with a low score to help them then increase their score to enter the A-list under the framework in the future, hopefully. Um, finally, this is not done for the whole portfolio. Um, the overall engagement list was narrowed down to a handful of companies to increase the chances of having pro uh, pro proactive responses to our engagement. And if I could just jump to the final slide of my section, please. Um, so here, as you see in the, in the final slide, um, this is just a little overview of the expected outcomes of, of these practices that we're implementing at the moment. Uh, these will all be presented in an annual impact report, of course, for the portfolio. Uh, to give you some insight on that, that will be published in early in the next calendar year. Um, this report will reflect the engagements done for the year, any outcomes that were achieved, any challenges that we faced. That we'll be, you know, really hoping to share our success, but also, you know, our, our concrete steps that we took and challenges that we faced and how we overcame them for, for essentially the wider community to learn from as well. And at the same time, we'll be using you know, any data we get our hands on to, to present to the wider community and our investors, of course. Um, so anything around impact data, which we will gather from the portfolio. And that's very much focused on the green bond pocket within the portfolio and the corresponding CO2 emissions avoided achieved through these investments. Um, so this report, as mentioned, will actually pair quite nicely with this research report, which is what my colleagues have mentioned uh, as the market development plan today, and it's going to be very much the focus for the rest of the session. So with those two in mind, what you essentially have is specific lessons learned from this portfolio of applying the framework and a research paper that, that will complement that. And hopefully that will be allow us to spark uh, some in-depth discussions with the wider community and with you folks on an ongoing basis. Um, so thank you for listening from, to my, my short presentation. I'll, I'll hand it back to AIB now, I believe. Thanks very much, Tobias. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, um, as my colleague Jingyi outlined, uh, we have the Climate Change Investment Framework. We have the Climate Bond Portfolio, which is governed by that framework. And we also have the plan to roll out a markets development plan where we talk about the applicability of this investment framework. Now, far be it from us to say that this is the best uh, framework since sliced bread. Uh, what we really wanted to see was also other industry, industry practitioners challenge us and also test it and also apply it to different kinds of sectors. So in this slide over here, I've outlined uh, a screenshot of the investment framework, which was published last year. And what we have done this year was, is to develop uh, research that will be published next year in 2022 that will outline the findings by three uh, reputable and uh, professional outfits working on climate finance. First is Fitch Solutions, who will be looking at applying the climate investment framework towards the analysis of sectors. Second, Carbon Trust, a sustainability consulting firm, is looking to apply the climate change investment framework towards specific companies. And we've asked the organizers of this conference, CBI, to look at the framework and see if it applies to issuers as well. And obviously compare and contrast the framework with its, with its own uh, way of assessing greenness and so forth. In this way, we can is hope that the research will identify best performers and best practices, highlight and highlight trends and issues now, in terms of the scope of analysis for this particular research report, which uh, I would emphasize again, will not come out till early next year. The sectors that the research covers are essentially what AIB invests in today, energy, telecommunications, transport, utilities, healthcare, automotive, basic industries, technology, and electronics. Uh, in terms of the global coverage, We've asked our program partners to focus on the members of AIB, which essentially means Greater Asia. Now, the next person that will be speaking is from Fitch and who'll be talking about the sectors. I would like to emphasize that 
we will not be revealing the research results today. The, res the, the research will only come out next year. The next following presentations will show you how broker partners have applied the framework and the challenges and the ease at which they apply the frameworks towards the analysis. So with this, I'd like to welcome uh, Michelle from Fitch to uh, share her findings on applying the framework to work se uh, sectors. Hello, and thank you for having me here today to discuss the Fitch Solutions sector trackers that we're developing in conjunction with AIB, Amundi, um, carbon trust and uh, climate bonds. Um, so just a quick introduction before I move into the presentation. My name is Michelle Caravis and I'm head of industry research at Fitch Solutions. Um, so quick comment on Fitch Solutions. We are part of the Fitch group and we cover country and industry um, research across 200 plus markets globally. Um, we cover over 20 industries and this specialism within sectors and industries is where we're adding um, value to this project. So our focus is really on the sector application of the framework and seeing how it works across multiple sectors. And um, so if we can move on to the first slide, please, Calvin. Um, another comment here is just that whilst we are Fitch Group and Fitch Ratings is our sister company, um, it's required by me to say that our comments are not a reflection of Fitch Ratings views. Um, so what, now I've got that out of the way, um, I just wanted to give a bit of an introduction to our sector trackers. Um, so as Calvin said, we're developing eight sector specific trackers um, and the aim is to consider and measure companies based on alignment with the AIB and climate change framework. And by extension, those three key objectives of the Paris Agreement that Jing Yu mentioned earlier. So the objective of our trackers is to identify key metrics on a sector level to assess progress towards the Paris Agreement objectives and therefore alignment with the climate change investment framework. To understand the variations by sector, so what does it look like to be doing well um, in achieving these objectives on a sector by sector basis? And then understand within each sector which companies are furthest along in the transition to a low carbon climate resilient world. So what does a successful company look like within a sector? What, what, what does success look like and, and how on a sector by sector are we able to measure that? So if we move on to the next slide please, Calvin. Um, let's start to get into the weeds of the methodology. So as I mentioned, in total, we'll be producing eight sector-specific transition trackers. Um, those are the sectors that Calvin mentioned earlier. Um, and one thing that I'll discuss more about later is that we really found that we had to develop eight independent trackers because the data availability and the comparability um, owing to business models was really um, limited on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. So I'll talk a little, little bit more about that later. But for the purposes of explaining the kind of the overall structure, I've given a kind of a templated example here of what, what that index structure looks like generally across the board. So if we look at in each of the three, um, three uh, in, we've mirrored the three pillars of the Paris Agreement in our index, but we've also added on a fourth pillar, which I'll talk about in a little bit later, which is financial capability. So the three pillars that we've uh, mirrored, we've got mitigation, climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, and, climate, and contribution to the transition. So as I mentioned, there's a fourth pillar, financial capability. I'll come back to that in a minute and come back and talk about what that's, why we've added that. So if we look at climate change mitigation, what are we trying to measure under this pillar? So we're seeking to understand whether a company is reducing its carbon footprint, so its total carbon emissions, um, in order to meet these objectives of mitigation. So in particular, we're looking at whether what a company's total carbon emissions are, um, its climate policies, it's, does it have targets, um, does it have people in charge of looking after these targets? And some of the sample indicators that we looked at for this part, um, which is the bottom row of the um, on the slide um, is total carbon footprint. So we're looking at current and, and uh, historic. So is there a transition towards a lower carbon footprint? And then the carbon mitigation approach. So as I mentioned, do you have targets um, for reducing carbon emissions? Do you have people in charge of those targets who have a mandate to actually achieve that? So moving on to adaptation. Um, under this pillar, we sought to measure the exposure of a company to the physical risk of climate change, as well as measure the exposures in its supply chain, its disaster management and its raw material acquisition as a result of the adverse impacts of climate change. So can it still operate its business model um, when we see water scarcity increasing or access to certain commodities increasing because of the physical risk of climate change? Um, so when we when we look through this indicator, the types of indicators we're looking here are things like supply chain management. So as I said, can you still um, operate your, your business, your supply chain? with the adverse impacts of climate change um, coming into, into place um, and disaster management. Do you have physical risk management? How exposed are you to physical risk? Um, and do you have processes to, to limit that exposure? 
Finally, um, of the three pillars, um, we looked at contribution to the transition. So under this pillar, we're seeking to measure how a company is making its revenue stream greener and investing in new technologies to support the green economy, as well as making their own operations greener. So in particular, we're looking to understand what portion of revenues is generated from low carbon technologies or low carbon industries, um, and what efforts are underway to make the end products of this company less carbon intensive and the investments into new technologies that will support the company over a longer term period um, to transition to a low carbon economy relevant company. So the two types of indicators, two of the sample indicators I've highlighted for this pillar um, are asset modernization. So um, are you investing in new, more sustainable, less energy intensive assets, um, and as well as capital expenditure, research and development budgets, for example, on green technologies. So if we move on to the next slide, um, I'll just talk about this kind of additional indicator that we decided to add in to help measure um, sector progress towards um, the a low carbon climate resilient world. So we added in a pillar called financial capability. This was kind of a fourth pillar to our index. And the intention here is to understand the financial capability of a company to undertake the measures that we outline in the other three pillars to um, align with the Paris agreements. So why did we decide to add this, this, this extra pillar effectively? Well, as we were looking through all of the different objectives and the different strategies to move towards a, a mitigation, contribution and adaptation, we saw that there was actually a lot of expensive investments that companies needed to make in order to fulfill on its objectives in these areas. So this ranged from research and development to look at new low carbon technologies. It looked it, um, focused on things like you had to hire, uh, you had to launch new business lines, which obviously cost marketing, cost research and development, um, market exposures. Um, we looked at things like if you're going to set a carbon target, well, you need to have personnel in place who can actually look at um, how do you measure your existing carbon footprint? You have to invest in new monitoring software to understand what your actual position is right now, as well as to track um, how you're moving forward on this, um, as well as kind of sourcing new materials if you're going to um, move your supply chains or, or reduce your raw material or raw material exposure, um, you have to look at new materials, new technologies, um, as well as investing in infrastructure to make your facilities more resilient to climate risk. So all of these things cost quite a lot of money. And so we felt that companies who are in a more financially stable position, better access to capital, would be in a better place to both set targets, um, because they'd know better about what they actually could achieve, um, as well as actually achieve those targets. So they'd have the capability to invest to actually um, fulfill on their targets. And so we felt that this was worth adding in to just give us a bit of a steer as to whether these um, object objectives were achievable by a company. So it's no use saying, you know, we're going to be carbon neutral by 2030 if you have no, no way of getting there. So this was a kind of a, I guess, a, um, a way of just checking ourselves in terms of the, the objectives that we had there. Um, I will mention that it's really important to say that whilst we note that you have to have you have to be relatively financial stable to financially stable to um, set these objectives and get to them. Once you do so, you will recoup that investment um, manifold over the longer term. We believe that greater alignment with the Paris Agreement pillars and the climate change framework will create a more financially stable company. Um, its revenue streams will be protected from the climate impact and it will be more suited to generate income and revenue within a low carbon economy. So it is something that is an upfront investment, but will be recouped manifold over the longer term. So let's move on to the next slide. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how did we collect the data correlated to this index. So once we set our broad index structure, how did we start to, to build out the, the data underneath that index? So as I already discussed, we're focusing on eight specific sectors. So that was our starting point. And the companies that we're including um, under each sectors uh, were all based in AIB members. And in particular, we focused on regional members. So those that are located primarily in Asia, and they had to be publicly listed with a relatively decent market capitalization so we could actually get the amount of data that we were looking for. Um, so we were trying to capture some geographic diversity. So we didn't kind of want all countries, uh, all companies based in one country. So we tried to capture a relative geographic diversity as well so that we could try to draw some conclusions on geography as well. So in terms of building out all of the individual metrics under each pillar and collecting data, I'll talk through now our approach to doing so. So we start by defining that list of target companies. As I said, do they are they in the right um, located in the right geographies? Are they in the right sectors? Are they publicly listed? Do they have the right market cap? So we build a list of companies that we think are good representations of an industry. 
At that point, we then delve deeper into a couple of those companies that are maybe bellwethers for the industry or kind of the larger companies and a, and a few smaller, just to give us a sample of the type of data that's actually available and has been published. So we're looking at things like the company's climate, so, um, corporate social responsibility reports. We're looking at the publicly available annual or quarterly reports and any other reports that they publish related to carbon targets or, or um, any approach towards uh, moving towards uh, a climate resilient world. And so at this point, we start to get a better idea of what data is actually available on an industry by industry basis. And we found that that data is quite different um, on a sector by sector basis. As I say, I'll come back to that in a minute. We also bring in our sector experts here. As I say, we cover 20 different industries within Fitch Solutions. So we have an expertise across all the industries to say, well, what does doing doing well in terms of climate transition look like within an industry? If you are um, trying to make your revenue stream greener, what does that look like within autos, for example, or utilities? Um, how, how does that work and, and what are we supposed to be looking out for? So we used our sector expertise aligned with the data that was available to refine a list of indicators that we were going to track under each of the pillars. Once we've defined that, we undertake a more substantial data collection. So we really then roll that out for all the different companies that we're, we're tracking within that, within that sector. And actually, given the large variation in data quality, um, the gaps in the data, and actually we, we noticed a lack of precise reporting. So some people would report in different units, for example, um, we had to do some normalization of the data. Um, and so we, we did some normalization as well as relying in some cases on qualitative indicators that we turned into quantitative numbers. So as an example, when we were looking at um, the climate mitigation policy, we said, okay, do they have somebody in charge of this? Okay, well, if they have someone in charge who is at board level, who is mandated, um, then they get a, a higher score than if they have, you know, somebody who's got two roles and is kind of their part-time job, or if they don't have anybody at all, then they obviously get a lower score. So we tried to apply some qualitative metrics to some quantitative indicators here. Um, and this allowed, oh, sorry, quantitative indicate metrics to qualitative indicators the other way around. Um, and this allowed us to try and take quite a diverse range of data and to um, condense it into numbers. Um, and so the final phase of that data collection is really creating that normalized qualitative quantitative scores, creating um, processes by which we do that. So we have um, different um, levels that you could point to based on the type of data available. So as I mentioned, throughout this process, we've come to a few initial conclusions about the quality of the data and our ability to create uniformity in measuring progress against the Paris Agreement objectives and therefore the climate framework that um, we've heard outlined today already by AOB and Amundi. So in particular, we found the quality of data to be highly mixed. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the variations that we found on a sector basis and on a pillar basis in the final two slides. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, whilst we found a lot of reporting on corporate social responsibility, on sustainability, a lot of it's commentary and there's actually limited ability to directly compare across company and especially across sector um, so this is why we relied in some cases on qualitative metrics so a vast range in the quality of the data um, and now i'll move on to talking about the conclusions on a pillar and on a on a sector basis so if i can have the next slide please calvin so let's start off with the, the pillar so the, the four pillars of the index in particular the three pillars of the paris agreement so so what are our key conclusions that we'll elaborate more on in the final report but just a kind of a teaser here for, for what our key conclusions are on a, on a data basis um so i've tried to capture the increasing degree of difficulty of data collection by pillar using a kind of traffic light system on this slide um, so hardest on the left adaptation to easiest on the right financial capability so of course, financial capability was easiest to find data for. It's our own metric that we added in. Um, if you noticed on the slide previously where I mentioned this, all of the data points we're searching for here are, are pretty standard financial metrics. They're available across all industries or sectors or companies. Uh, this was not, not a problem for us to find this data and it was kind of our, our, our one comparable, very comparable pillar of our index. So then we move on to the three Paris Agreements objectives. Um, and actually, by far the area with the most data available is mitigation. I think this echoes what Tobias was saying earlier. Um, companies are generally reporting their carbon emissions, their carbon footprints, their carbon reduction targets. They're making very clear what policies they have and what internal structures they have to meet these aims. And we found that actually mitigation is probably the pillar where you could compare across sector best um, although still um, there are variations in that but we found that mitigation was the, the the pillar that was the most consistent across all the sectors and where we found the most data available 
Moving on to contribution, um, this was the pillar that we found that the data varied quite substantially on a, on a sector by sector basis. Um, and this really was dependent on the correlation of your main revenue stream with carbon emissions and, and you know, fossil fuels or something like that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we move on to the sector variations. Um, but it's just worth mentioning that, you know, the contribution was highly varied uh, for some sectors, utilities, autos, et cetera, where there's a very clear correlation um, with your carbon emissions and your reliance on fossil fuels. It was easier than those sectors, healthcare, um, technology telecoms, where it's less clear, we had to get a bit more creative. So I'll talk about that in a minute. And um, finally, just a mention on uh, uh, on adaptation. Um, and this, we found the hardest area to find data on. And this echoes what Tobias was saying earlier. Um, companies are not generally forthcoming about um, potential physical exposure to climate change, although we can use country level um, data points to figure this out. But the mitigation of this, and I think as, as Tobias said, we're kind of marking companies down for exposure rather than marking them up for investments made to, to limit that exposure because we're not able to find that data as easily as, as we would like. Um, and so what we ended up doing here was looking at things where we um, are trying to be a bit creative about how we measure adaptation. So the things that companies were reporting, which were efforts to shift their supply chains um, and their exposure to more material raw materials to make them more resilient over the longer term. So for example, water usage, we know water is becoming increasingly scarce because of climate change. Uh, where are companies seeking to reduce their exposure to water usage? Similarly, certain raw materials that are being exposed to um, climate change because of, you know, it's less easy to farm them um, or whatever else, um, you know, maybe maybe impacting in terms of availability of raw materials. Um, companies that are looking to synthetic op options or are looking to um, shift their raw material exposure to something that's more going to be more available in a um, you know more climate changed world. Um, those are the types of things that we ended up looking at for adaptation. Um, and we ended up going with more of a country level um, score to look at the broader physical risk of a country, of a company. Um, so adaptation, we had some challenges. We definitely figured it out. So I guess it's, it's red in terms of it was a warning sign, but we've managed to make sense of all of these indicators and create data um, that does work across all of these pillars. Um, but we had greater challenges, for example, in adaptation and mitigation. Um, so moving on to the final slide, which is on a sector by sector basis. So I just want to finish um, by talking through some of the sector level conclusions. Of course, our objective here was to look at this framework on a sector basis. Um, and we did this across the eight sectors that are listed um, on the, again, kind of traffic light type of system that I've put here. Um, we didn't have a red one for this one because actually we found all of the data, all of the sectors, we were able to find the data relatively straightforward um, but definitely it was harder for healthcare for example than it was for some of those um, as I said very direct correlation to carbon emissions industries energy utilities transport and automotive um, so this conclusion the main conclusion on a sector basis was that um, there was vast differences between the sectors in terms of the data and in certain pillars the sectors were becoming much less comparable. So contribution being being the one that we found it the least able to compare. Um, as I mentioned, what does doing well look like for a pharmaceutical or healthcare company versus an energy company? Those two things are not easily comparable. If you're an energy company, utilities company, you shift to renewable energy, alternative fuels, it's quite straightforward how your revenue stream can be shifted to a less carbon um, intense revenue stream. I think how you can um, move your technologies. Um, healthcare, it, it's not so easy. You know, there's less of an existing carbon footprint. So how do you reduce that carbon footprint? So one thing that we found was for energy, utilities, transport, automotives, we were all able to um, track those types of, um, of uh, those shifts and we could understand how these companies were becoming more carbon resilient. And we could use that type of data that was quite clear that I mentioned previously. So shifting to fossil, shifting away from fossil fuels. Um, where we moved to the middle section, telecoms, technology, electronics, basic industries, this is where we had to get a little bit more creative with how we understood what um, this sector was doing. And so if you think of something like telecoms, it doesn't have a clear um, revenue stream or, or technologies that are correlated with carbon emissions. But actually, if you think about the energy intensity of the technology that's used and the energy intensity, intensity of the infrastructure underlying these industries, that's where you start to get a better idea of carbon emissions and, and the abilities to limit those. So for telecoms, for example, moving towards 5G infrastructure, which is much newer, less um, energy intensive to run, that was something that would have scored a company quite well within that sector. 
um, basic industries, we're looking at things like how are you developing, um, well, we actually for basic industries had to narrow down to, to green and environmental building, because actually a lot of the industries under basic industries are, are outside of the scope of what you would invest in because they are so um, heavily exposed to, to carbon emissions. Um, so looking at green building, for example, we were looking at things like, um, are you building infrastructure that's renewable infrastructure, renewable energy, are you building energy efficient buildings? Um, are you building um, you know, the things that will contribute, electricity charging stations, those types of things are actually gonna to contribute to a low carbon um, climate resilient world. Um, and then finally, if we move on to healthcare, this is the one where we find the greatest challenge. Um, there's no obvious climate um, or carbon emissions from the healthcare industry, right? I mean, there are, but it's not directly correlated with their revenue stream. And so here we had to look at the, the production cycle and look at the supply chain, look at the production process, how much energy is consumed in producing, say, uh, pharmaceuticals, how much energy is consumed by the packaging for pharmaceuticals. And so really getting even more creative with how we understood um, the in particular contribution, but also mitigation adaptation for healthcare. And so these are, these are the kind of variations that we found on a, a sector by sector basis. So the conclusion here was that we had to create eight independent trackers, one for each industry. Um, we are going to try to understand some correlation between the industries in our final report, we're going to try to look at um, what are the commonalities and can we create some comparisons. Um, but for now, eight independent trackers looking at eight different sectors is what we'll be producing. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we actually were able to produce data and find data across all the sectors, across all of the pillars, um, and, you know, kind of looking forward to, to publishing our final results um, in the near term. So thank you um, to everyone for listening to me today, and I'll hand uh, back to Calvin for the next section. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I'd like to hand over now to uh, Singy from uh, Carbon Trust, who will be talking about their findings in terms of applying this Analysis, this framework to us, the analysis of companies. And just a word, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that we will be, have, we will have time for question and answers after the, the two presentations which are, are coming up. So off to, uh, on to you, uh, Singy. Thank you so much, Calvin. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you so much. Thank you, Calvin, and thank you so much to the CBI organizers for having um, Carbon Trust at this presentation today. It's really an honor and pleasure to be presenting this project. A brief introduction to myself. I'm Sini. I'm the Green Finance Lead of Southeast Asia, and I'm based in the Carbon Trust Singapore office. Um, the Carbon Trust is a sustainability consultancy that is headquartered in <coughs> London with over 300 uh, members representing over 30 nationalities, and we are based across five continents. As a company, we work with businesses and governments to help them align their strategies with climate science and meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. We provide expert advice and assurance um, giving investors and also financial institutions the confidence that green finance has genuinely green outcomes. And finally, we support development of low carbon technologies and solutions, helping to build the foundations for the energy system of the future. In this uh, next slide, please. We see that the climate emergency is affecting businesses worldwide and we are facing many uncertainties and challenges in this shift to a sustainable low carbon future. The recent IPCC report itself has branded uh, has been branded code rate for humanity and it warns of reaching 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2040 in all scenarios. This can occur earlier if the emissions are not slashed in the next few years. The findings add to the growing pressure that already exists for Asian companies to act on climate change. For example, Singapore as a country is considering setting green standards for power generation companies as part of our efforts to reduce the carbon footprint. In Malaysia, Maybank announced it will no longer finance new coal activities as part of its five-year strategy. This announcement comes after criticisms from a coalition of NGOs in Malaysia and Indonesia for funding coal plants despite making environmental, social, and governance commitments. And finally, a number of stock exchanges in Asia, including those in Hong Kong, Indo India, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, have already made ESG reporting for public listed companies a requirement in their listing rule. And this accelerates the corporate disclosures in terms of the sustainability practices. 
And while these steps are in the right direction, more can be done to align corporates with international expectations and translate the expectations into concrete efforts on the ground. The AI v Amundi Climate Change Investment Framework is an excellent endeavor to translate these objectives of the Paris Agreement into investment risk and opportunities. It also provides general investment matrix to guide assessment of an issuer's climate change strategy. So for example, um, company level practices um, that usually demonstrate uh, corporate intentionality towards aligning business activities to climate related uh, considerations can include a clearly articulated climate change strategy that is integrated into the core business approach. Um, it could also include um, executive responsibility to implement the climate change strategies, um, alignment to international industry reporting standards like the TCFD, and also non-involvement in any climate related incidents that could result in reputational damage. By using this framework to guide and structure a company's approach to climate change along the dimensions of mitigation, adaptation and transition, this allows companies and investors or their financiers to be speaking the same language and facilitate better evaluation of performance among corporates within the same sector and or geography. In the next slide, the Carbon Trust has been appointed as one of the program partners to produce case studies in emerging markets for the annual flagship report. This is done with a view to capture the company's challenges, opportunities, and enablers regarding climate change risk management practices and the low carbon transition. Our approach consists of three parts. So the first is questionnaire development that involves evaluation of the issuers in terms of their alignment with the Paris Climate Goals. As part of developing this questionnaire, we referenced the criteria used by the Carbon Trust Climate Leadership Framework or what we call the CLF, as well as the Transition Pathway Initiative or TPI. The CLF is informed by the Carbon Trust considerable expertise working with companies worldwide on reducing their climate impact. It reviews a company's current performance on climate change using a scorecard assessment before providing specific actions in a bespoke net zero roadmap that can be embedded in their strategic plans. The CLF helped to inform the design of our questionnaire because it assesses a company's climate performance across three dimensions. The first will be own operations, and this refers to all emissions under the company's operational control. The second will be value chain, where we look at upstream and downstream emissions in the supply chain and with the customers. And finally, the third point will be looking at avoided emissions, which concerns the development of products and services that contribute to net zero emissions future. On the other hand, the TPI is a global initiative led by asset owners and supported by asset managers. The TPI aims to assess companies' preparedness for the transition to a low carbon economy and is increasingly seen as the go-to corporate climate action benchmark. We use the question level scores to calculate the average score for their respective framework categories on a scale of one to four. The second part will be company selection. The scope of our research covers eight sectors, which are aligned to what Fitches is doing and looking at which are energy, telecommunications, transport, utilities, healthcare, automotive, basic industries, as well as technology and electronics. Our target geographies for this is China, India, Indonesia, South Korea, and Singapore. Using these parameters, we created a database indicating whether companies were featured or ranked on a few platforms, which are a science-based targets uh, initiative, SBTI, CDP, RE100, Global 100, TCFD supporters, and Transition Pathway Initiative, TPI. We also considered whether the company is a pure player or a diversified player, and whether it has issued bonds before. We shortlisted our companies based on a few factors. First, the companies do not belong to the sectors which AIB Amundi have excluded from their investments, for example, agriculture and coal companies. We also excluded companies that had a CDP score of F or not applicable from the list and also at the same time did not feature in any of the other rankings like TCFD. 
We then filtered the entries by sector and selected those companies which would make for an interesting narrative around what A-lister or B-lister could look like in a case study. So for example, an oil and gas company which achieved a B score on CDP in contrast with its peers that achieved C or D score. And in cases where companies do not perform well across the different dimensions, we shortlisted those that have announced interest to pursue carbon neutrality as we are keen to find out their plans and whether they will be potential climate champions in the future. The third part is stakeholder interviews. Based on the questionnaire, we identify a list of questions related to climate mitigation, adaptation and transition that would be suitable to this company based on their profile. The interviews were conducted with a view to obtaining a more forward-looking information of what the company is planning to achieve in the short term as well as the long term. We are looking at information that might not be available from the existing matrix or any other quantitative data and provides more context into the company's motivations. In the third slide, today we want to look at the, the, the current status and we have interviewed companies across various sectors which are energy, telecommunications, technology and electronics, utilities, healthcare and automotive. We have a few interesting insights from our interviews and I'll share them to whet your appetite. In general, the Asian companies we spoke to have demonstrated efforts to improve energy efficiency measures in their direct operations. And they also work closely with other stakeholders such as suppliers to set energy saving and emission reduction targets. The focus on energy efficiency as a means to reduce emissions tend to be greater in countries like Singapore where there is limited renewable energy supply. We see our case studies as a useful platform to amplify and scale up the adoption of energy efficiency, especially among carbon intensive companies in ASEAN and Asia. There is still significant untapped energy efficiency opportunities across the region and the Carbon Trust has long advocated for companies to be looking at reducing their own and their suppliers' energy use as a first step. Although energy efficiency investments often have short payback periods and improve a company's competitiveness, the upfront capital cost and lack of awareness around energy efficiency often mean that these opportunities are not tackled. The second observation is that many companies tend to be at the early stages of adopting ultra-low emission vehicles or what we call ULEVs, even though they were aware of the benefits. A major determining factor seems to be linked to the government's view of EVs and efforts to create that conducive environment, for example, the availability of charging facilities in the countries where they operate. And third observation is that some companies we spoke to made efforts to invest into green and sustainable solutions. However, they are not always able to attach a precise figure to the volume of their investments due to a lack of a common definition around what constitutes green. We will disclose more details in our case study and at this point of time we could talk about the structure of these case studies which we anticipate to include first the country and sector context for climate transition, um, second we'll be looking at challenges, opportunities and enablers to transition along with the key outcomes linked to the framework themes. And also third will be in some explanation on how this case study can then help other issuers and become a scalable solution. Thank you so much for your time and it's my pleasure um, presenting. I'll hand the time over to Calvin. Thanks very much, uh, Singy. We have one last presentation and now coming in from CBI who has looked at applying the framework towards the analysis of issuers. So without any further ado, let me hand it over to Krista. Thank you, Calvin. So thank you for being here, everybody, to kick off our fifth annual Climate Bonds Initiative Conference. We really hope that you find lots of interesting content and engagement opportunities here throughout the week. We're also really grateful to our partners here, AIB, Amundi, Fitch Solutions, and Carbon Trust for joining us and hosting the session today. So thank you, guys. Great way to get the, the week going. So my name is Krista Tukianen. I'm the head of research at Climate Bonds Initiative. We are, for those of you who might not know, uh, an investor-facing not-for-profit organization headquartered also in London, but operating globally. 
we have for the past 10 or so years been on a mission to mobilize the USD $110 trillion bond market for climate change solutions. And to that end, we provide data and research uh, with a mission to, to identify credible climate investment opportunities. This is all based on a rigorous process for building definitions, and we've pioneered this process since 2013. The outcomes of that are summarized in the climate bonds taxonomy, which we revisit regularly to add new definitions as we build them together with our expert stakeholder groups. I've included some examples of some products that use the various data sets that we produce below just for you to get an idea of how they practically are applied in the market. So, and also just to, to mention before we get into this framework, we're very grateful to, to AIB for having had the privilege of providing some input into and then endorsing the framework. So thank you to Jimmy and Calvin for mentioning that as well. If we get to the next slide, please. I'll talk you through our approach to applying the framework. So climate bonds are best, uh, perhaps best known for, for our green bond analysis, focusing on in individual instruments. But in fact, we focused on analyzing both bonds and issuers to understand risks and opportunities at multiple levels of investment for, for a while now. But engaging with the AIB framework has really helped further push us in that more holistic direction to overcome some of the key limitations that are often uh, levied at uh, focusing on individual green bonds. And these include some of the things that have already been mentioned by my colleagues here, including sector coverage and potentially the lack of understanding of performance of an entire issuer vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, importantly, all three pillars of the Paris Agreement, not just one. So this work has been a great exercise for us in connecting the dots of work that we've already been doing for a while. Next slide, please, Carmen. Thank you. So how have we gone about this? Similarly to the other program partners' presentations here, over the course of this research and in the next uh, coming few months before we publish the, the results of the first round, we started to look at all three pillars of the framework, and you can see the metrics simplified, uh, extracted from the framework itself there at the top in the boxes, and then some key indicators that we've translated those metrics into in order to analyze specifically bond issuers. These draw on, <clears throat> pardon me, existing client bonds expertise. They've been adapted to analysis that is based on publicly available information that uh, relates to the issuers themselves. And this in itself is a key limitation of the research. Uh, because the, as, as mentioned by, by many of my colleagues here, the, the information is, is definitely far from, from uniform and is constantly developing to match up with uh, new requirements. You'll also notice we've added labeled green bonds, any, any that are issued by these issuers within the pool of research as a further measure of contribution, and I'll mention why in a moment. Now, the next slide, I'll talk you through more detail of our application of these three pillars in this order, and we'll start with the contribution to transition. Thanks, Calvin. So for this work, we, we look at the whole climate bond universe, and essentially this comprises two main strands. Labeled bonds here on the left-hand side, which are typically identified and analyzed, as I mentioned, on a per-instrument basis. And then on the right-hand side, unlabeled instruments from so-called climate-aligned issuers. And these are the starting point of this research as we've uh, applied it to the framework. As these types of bonds do not carry any kind of label, we go about identifying them based on issuer level analysis, focusing on revenue streams. So this links it back to one of the key metrics under the contribution pillar of the AIB framework. Next slide, please. The, the actual process for identifying climate aligned or green revenues, if you will, starts from the climate bonds taxonomy, the classification system that I alluded to previously. And for this work, we've adapted it to what we call activity tables to essentially better match the disclosure that is available regarding revenue streams. Um, Michelle from Fitch earlier mentioned that they found a lot of data variance within the contribution pillar in different sectors. We had less of an issue with this because we apply these um, to, to sort of green principles and green definitions only. But we do expect this to get more varied per, on a per sector basis as we build and apply new definitions to the more expensive to abate sectors like industrials and materials. Currently, this coverage is, is, uh, is limited. So in this work, we don't look at assets, unfortunately, because there is yet a significant dearth of information to distinguish their linkages to any sort of low carbon objectives um, or, or sort of mitigation targets. And also because revenues are a fairly common proxy indicator across this space, other providers are doing similar work. Obviously, this is also an indicator in this framework. 
And this, are, this approach has also been adopting, uh, adopted in sort of emerging assessments for eligibility against uh, uh, things like the, the AU taxonomy and the, the China Green Project catalog. So for this work, we look at both private and public companies. So they, they don't all need to be listed, but there is a prerequisite of them needing to have bonds outstanding. This data set only includes issuers that have a minimum 75% of green revenue. So these issuers are already performing really highly on the contribution pillar. And just to note that to say that this data coverage extends backwards to the beginning of 2005, based on the first available bond issuance date for anything that still has funds outstanding. Next slide, please. So if we move on to mitigation strategies. When Climate Bond started to build our approach to the application of the framework, we drew on the metrics therein, but also on in-house thinking that has been evolving and developing in collaboration with our broader stakeholder base, as is the case with our green definitions as well. We started from these five principles, which were defined as part of a white paper on financing credible transitions, which was in fact published at our conference last year. So a very uh, please be connecting the dots there too. Some key takeaways from, from these principles uh, include our sort of position that mitigation strategies, despite issuer sector, should be based on science. They should lean on actual emission reductions and not offsets. Um, and they should be technology driven, which is to say they should focus on the most viable technologies and not necessarily cost. And of course, they should link back to demonstrable action and progress and not simply forward-looking targets in isolation of any assessment of progress made. Next slide, please. There we go, thank you. Uh, to look more practically into the way that we went about applying the mitigation pillar of the ARB framework to bond issuers, we drafted these five sets of indicators, which draw on a new paper on our approach to assessing entity transitions, which will be published later this week. So there's lots to look forward to in that regard as well. We start from examining whether an issuer has set targets that are appropriate and ambitious, meaning that they link back to the issuer's sector specific pathway. Again, alluding to something that Michelle has said earlier, we would also like to see them cover their life cycle emissions. So all through scopes one through three, and be regularly uh, reappraised to make sure that they continue to be ambitious and appropriate. We then look at whether an issuer has been able to establish what we call the enabling environment. So essentially create their strategy, create an associated financing plan to make sure that they can implement that strategy and make all of these things happen, and then have the, <clears throat> the necessary governance frameworks in place to ensure that this is done in a robust way and with credibility. Then we look at the action side. So taking action to set the wheels in motion, can the issuer show that it's taking action both on investment side as well as actually shifting its operations? And here, the contribution pillar and there in the, the metric in the framework itself to show a change in, in revenue and, and activities over time towards mitigation is a great way to measure that going forward. We then want issuers to show progress uh, and monitoring progress against some of their selected targets to track performance and also undergo re-evaluation and recalibration of these targets, not necessarily only for the, the, um, the greenhouse gas emission reduction, but other things that relate to a material transition within its industry. Of course, all of this is underpinned by ongoing reporting and verification. We would like to see this done by an independent third party to make sure that uh, this is done in a very robust way as well. Next slide, please. On the adaptation side, we again echo the issues highlighted earlier by some of our part program partners here in that it remains a challenge to find information about adaptation at the issuer level. Therefore, for this pillar, we decided to draw on an external open source database, which is structured on a country basis. This is the ND gain index from Notre Dame University. What we've done is to overlay that on the domiciles and where possible the entire, well, key operations locations at the very least, if not whole supply chains of the issuers that we've analyzed. And we will then seek to supplement those with the climate resilience principles, which we published in collaboration with some of our other stakeholders in late 2019. And we've specifically looked at principles one through three and six. So essentially how an issuer has set boundaries for what constitutes resilience building and adaptation activities for them, 
how they've assessed their risk with regards to resilience, uh, what measures they've put in place and how they're monitoring and evaluation, evaluating them over time. So you can see the common strands there as well vis-a-vis -vis the mitigation work that I've just alluded to before. Next slide, please. And finally, to give you an idea of what kinds of results the application of this framework is yielding, I want to show you a few summary case studies of anonymized issuers from Emerging Market Asia, so essentially AIB members. In this instance, these cover uh, three different countries. And I'd like to point out here again the differences between their performance on the physical risk side, but also the transition risk. The physical risk uh, performance is lower. This is in part due to the, the vulnerability of the geographies within which these issuers are located, but also the fact that they seem to have prioritized uh, addressing mitigation as the kind of key focal point to begin their transition over potentially thinking about adaptive measures. On the transition risk side, they're performing relatively highly. Some of them have started implementing TCFD recommendations and identifying climate risks and opportunities on an ongoing basis. Some of them have uh, science-based net zero targets, et cetera, et cetera, uh, whereas others are still in the, the very early stages of showing an intent to integrate sustainability more broadly as a part of their corporate strategy and as a key driver therein. On the contribution pillar, you can see that they're all, again, performing highly. They, they've all met the 75% threshold, but there is still variance, and, and this is to do with um, for, for example, on the bottom row, this, this utility issuer's uh, remaining residual production of uh, energy from fossil fuel related sources. Two of them have also issued green bonds. And if we move on to the final slide, I'll talk about uh, uh, why that is significant in the context of this research, as well as other things. Thank you, Calvin. So to summarize, some uh, emerging reflections from applying the, the climate change investment framework. We also found that there are lots of untapped opportunities that exist, especially in investing in unlabeled bonds that could still be considered to finance climate change solutions. So from issuers that have a high contribution to transition, we here have identified it based on revenue streams. Increasingly, some of these issuers are already issuing labeled green bonds along with their conventional unlabeled debt. This is significant because it confirms some of the findings that have come out of previous research that we've done in that green bond issuance seems to go loosely correlate with uh, lower transition risk, i.e. in the form of a better mitigation strategy. We think, based on what we've uh, been told by green bond issuers, that this is because the, the process of building a green bond issuance program, a framework, revisiting and revising it regularly, means that you have to review your strategy and your asset base and your operations to identify a large enough pool of eligible uh, expenditures, assets, projects, activities that can be packaged up into these instruments. So it's a great way to put everything into practical context and link the treasury function with some of the operational departments in a company, for example. Now, there's still definitely quality variance on mitigation strategies and progress on implementation. Again, I think similar findings to our program partners and most issuers do seem to prioritize mitigation as the first uh, part to, to tackle in terms of the three pillars. In many cases, information about adaptation at the issuer level is not available at all, which is in part why we decided to apply that pillar or the analysis uh, to construct that at the country level instead of the issuer level. Uh, as, a, as a kind of key point. Overall, though, I would say, um, echoing again some of the findings, that this framework has, for us at least, provided a much more holistic view of how issuers are performing in the context of all of these three pillars versus analyzing each ind individual pillar in isolation or, let alone, an individual green bond. So we're very excited to see the, the whole research come together. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and hand back over to Calvin and AIB to wrap us up. Thank you very much, Krista. Uh, we have, ladies and gentlemen, we are slightly uh, gone a bit over time with our presentations, but we did leave about 12 minutes left for Q&A. Um, I have received some of the questions uh, through the chat box and uh, this is all live. I'm now going to read the questions to uh, our program partners and to myself, and we'll see how we do with these questions that you've thrown at us. So this is real life entertainment. But first of all, 
let me try and uh, let's try with this easy first question that I received. What is the difference between the climate change investment framework and the green bonds principles as part of ICMA? Well, the climate change investment framework is anchored very strongly on the Paris Climate Change Accord, which is the only binding agreement that holds essentially governments accountable to addressing climate change. Whereas the green bonds principles, as many of you already know, do not actually provide very specific guidance on what is green, but, but provide actually more about best practices when it comes to the actual reporting of the proceeds that come from issuance of bonds, among other things. It has to, more systemic, it has to, do, more, has to do more systems as opposed to the greenness of a bond. So I'll take that I'll question off the list for now. Um, there's a question here from Fitch, Michelle, that I'm gonna to read to you slowly, okay? Uh, the mitigation pillar is about emissions and reduction plants. Um, and it appears obviously to be easy to find information about that, about these plants. But can you share how you thought about how you weigh the plants? Because in terms of likelihood, how do you know that this is gonna be realized? These are simply plans about the future. Was there any sense to kind of discount this if they were not considered to be credible? Uh, thank you, Calvin, and thank you for the question. Um, it's a really good question. Um, so obviously anybody can say we're going to try and be carbon neutral by 2040 or 2030 even. Um, how do we make sure that that's a realistic objective? So we looked at mitigation. We looked at the historic track record. So we looked at previous carbon emission, uh, carbon footprint, and then current carbon footprint. So are they moving in the right direction already? That gave us a good indication to say, well, they're actually taking this seriously, they're making progress, and they're already on the pathway. So that was a really important factor, was kind of that change over time, how are we move it, how are they progressing? And the other thing that we wanted to, to look at when we tried to understand the, I guess, seriousness of their objectives was um, this idea that they needed a mandate that was held by an individual that was reportable to the board. So do you have somebody in place who's in charge of this, who's actually charged with reporting on it, achieving it, whose role is defined by meeting these objectives? Um, if you didn't have somebody who actually had that role, that job title, we mark, it was less, um, you got a less high score, shall we say. Um, so we were looking at the mandate and the, the seriousness with which a company took it, we, we measured based on, do they have people in place whose job is to actually execute on that? And that really helped just to say, well, you know, it's all well and good to say you have this carbon neutral target, but you don't actually have a head of sustainability or a head of ESG or a head of, um, you know, uh, anything along those lines, then you probably aren't going to be able to achieve it. Um, so that was the two things, two of the things that we looked at in that, that mitigation pillar. Um, and then the final thing I would say is this is where this financial capability metric comes in, because what we also felt was that it's all well and good again to say we're going to have these really ambitious targets. But a lot of these targets um, require investment in the right ways to achieve them, i.e. hiring this person who is head of sustainability or head of um, ESG um, and mm. putting in place um, efforts to can have, do you have the capability to invest in tracking? So one of the things we actually looked at as well um, in one of the uh, sector trackers was, do you have the ability to track your emissions? So again, we need to be able to say, are you investing in a way that you are able to understand what your total emissions output is and a way of saying, okay, we're reducing it. So we're investing in the right type of technology to track and to limit the, those carbon emissions. So we tried to incorporate that across all the three pillars really, um, in particular mitigation and also adding this financial capability pillar to, to allow us to track that. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Hopefully, happy for any follow-up. Thanks, Michelle. Um, no, that's a great answer. I thought it was a great answer. Um, another great question that I received uh, that actually I think uh, is something that has been on my mind and I think on many people's minds is how we've chosen the various ways in which we've measured uh, climate performance. So. Uh, Tobias, this is a bit more up your avenue, perhaps, but I'll read out the question and see if anybody else would like to answer. The question is, while it's great to have transparency on the algorithms behind the ratings, do you feel that many companies get dismayed since different rating providers give mixed signals for the same disclosure? Uh, you know, the scoring 
it tends to defer, can defer based on different scoring uh, methodologies. Any thoughts about that, Tobias, or the rest of the people in this panel? Sure, uh, great question. <laughs> um, I think we all know that something that exists out there today, and there are also tools to, to get around that, to sort of verify some scores that you're using and, and looking at, I mean, you know, one, it's, an, it's additional layers that you can apply to an investment strategy. You know, you can do qualitative analysis to see if it fits with your G, ESG analysis view on that company, right? There are things that stand out quite easily, actually, when you go over these scores, so that's one thing, but uh, perhaps you would say that's not a scalable solution when you're working in the capital markets, you know, when you're working with thousands and thousands of names. Um, so one thing you can do is increase the, the data sources that you're using. So at Mundi, we use a blend of, of many different ESG data sets. And so rather than just relying on one, we don't really know what you're working with because you have no benchmark to compare it to. Having a full spectrum of scores, you can definitely find those outliers where perhaps things aren't making as much sense. And that, that's very much a motivation that we've applied here. To, to this framework as well. So we have data sets that we mobilize specific to the themes of the framework, but in the investment strategy as well, we're also using all of Amundi's usual, let's say ESG knowledge at the same time. So we're using Amundi's proprietary ESG rating uh, and other, some, some other data sources as well. And so with that, we kind of have a good toolbox to overcome that challenge. But I mean, you know, it's definitely worth saying that that is something that exists on the market today when you look at a lot of the ESG data sets. So as an investor looking to apply this framework, uh, necessary, you know, necessary steps need to be taken to, to overcome that challenge. And it's something that we, we, we hopefully managed to do. Thanks a lot, Tobias. So uh, Singy, I saw you nodding your head. Did you want to add to that? I know you've done some detailed uh, questionnaires with the companies to go essentially beyond the scoring, right? To get really more detailed and qualitative answers to the questions that you're posing. Yes, thank you so much, Calvin. I think I think there are just two points I want to add really um, in, in addition to what uh, Tobias has very kindly provided. I think the first is it really boils down to what investors are looking for. Um, mm -hmm. The companies that we spoke to are quite strong in terms of their um, ESG credentials, they have won many awards. Um, they are also, you know, publicly featured in many different channels. But at the end of the day, it does boil down to, you know, what is the investor looking for? What matters to them on ESG parameters? And I think in this particular instance, what matters to them in terms of climate mitigation, adaptation, and transition. So I think what is important is for investors to be clear on what they stand for, what they are looking for, and and then uh, then again, you know, with um, the ESG data providers, um, this is just really a starting point for further engagement. And I think what is unique about you know this region about ASEAN and Asia is that a lot of investors are are not um, as quick to look to divestment as a strategy. They are more keen mm. to engage with a lot of these companies. And I think what the ESG data providers can do is to give you a starting point from which you can springboard into further um, constructive engagement and discussion with the management um, and the board and also to get a good sense of what is their future plans. And I think what we have learned from this exercise really is that, you know, what we are seeing um, in, in, in terms of their forward-looking perspective does provide a lot more context as to where this company is headed. And I think that's what's most important um, in order to spur further action in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Singy. Um, great answer. And, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it was the spirit of this framework uh, to allow for various ways in which further types of analysis could be used to fully evaluate climate change performance. Uh, addressing climate change performance, right? So in, in, with respect to Fitch, they found it necessary to use a financial pillar. We also talked about the fact that uh, it, applying the, the framework to different kinds of sectors or different kinds of instruments would require you to ask different types of questions and so forth. So I, my personal view is that the, the, obviously the use of third-party scores is very useful, but needs to be um, uh, augmented with other types of analysis as well. Um, Krista, there really isn't a question here for you. Uh, I would like to allow you to say a few words as one of the program partners. Uh, but one thing that uh, I think your organization has been talking a lot about is perhaps a transition as well. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, you know, uh, 
the, the transition score, but something that you all have talked about is about having, having credible transitions. Maybe something that you want to just uh, highlight as the last comment before we close the session. Sure, thank you. I'll take the uh, lack of a question as a, as a good sign of a successful presentation, so no <laughs> problem there. Um, yes, we've, we've been working hard uh, across the CBI teams to, to establish essentially a program to, to create definitions for uh, assessing entity level transitions and putting in place uh, sort of green or transition related definitions for uh, calling them expensive to abate industries. And we find that really the, the kind of common threads that run through are indeed to, to move away from this kind of, uh, I guess, incumbent approach of saying it is good that you have a, a target and that's a tick on your the E and of your ESG score, but really looking uh, at nailing down the 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 assessment of, of ongoing progress and, and performance against metrics that are very importantly tied back to sector level pathways. And that's going to be the, the key piece of the puzzle that I think we, we still have a lot of work to do on collectively. But once we get sort of that nailed down and the, the requisite transparency around that, then I think um, we are going to be making progress in, in leaps and bounds, hopefully, quite quickly. Well, so maybe as a last as a last comment, sorry, Calvin, before I, uh, I drop off, just to to plug the 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 last day of this this week, we have a transition theme day to to wrap us up, and and we are indeed publishing additional analysis on this topic. So so stay tuned for that. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, Krista. Well, again, I'd like to plug again our climate change investment framework, which you can find on the AIB's uh, website, and also to plug the research that all our program partners today have kindly presented that will be coming out next year. And lastly, I'd like to thank uh, all of my panelists here today and also for the CBI for inviting us to present at this exciting uh, activity. Um, I think in a couple of seconds, I will essentially be blocked out and then the next session will come along. So I will leave it there uh, and um, wish, you, wish the, everybody here a very uh, uh, successful and exciting conference ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>